There is one mind common to all individual men. They are merely two spheres of activity within one mind. There are not two minds. Your conscious mind is the reasoning mind. It is that phase of mind which chooses, weighs, dissects, analyzes, investigates, scrutinizes, comes to conclusions and decisions. For example, you choose your books, your home, your partner in life. You make all your decisions with your conscious mind. On the other hand, without any conscious choice in your part, your heart is kept functioning automatically, and the process of digestion, circulation, and breathing are carried on by your subconscious mind through processes independent of your conscious control. Your subconscious mind accepts what is impressed upon it, or what you consciously believe. It does not reason out things like your conscious mind. It's a one-track mind. It does not argue with you controversially. Your subconscious mind is like the soil, which accepts any kind of idea, good or bad. Your thoughts are active and might be likened unto seeds. Negative destructive thoughts continue to work negatively in your subconscious mind, and in due time will come forth into outer experience, which corresponds with them. Remember, your subconscious mind does not engage in proving whether your thoughts are good or bad, true or false, but it responds according to the nature of your thoughts or suggestions. For example, if you consciously assume something to be true, even though it may be false, your subconscious mind will accept it as true and proceed to bring about results which must necessarily follow because you consciously assumed it to be true. Your subconscious mind cannot argue controversially. Hence, if you give it wrong suggestions, it will accept them as true and will proceed to bring them to pass as conditions, experience, and events. Your subconscious mind is oftentimes referred to as your subjective mind. Your subjective mind takes cognizance of its environment by means independent of the five senses. Your subjective mind perceives by intuition. It is the seat of your emotion and the storehouse of memory. Your subjective mind performs its highest functions when your objective senses are in abeyance. In a word, it is that intelligence which makes itself manifest when the objective mind is suspended or in a sleepy, drowsy state. Your subjective mind sees without the use of the natural organs of vision. It has the capacity of clairvoyance and clairaudience. Your subjective mind can leave your body, travel to distant lands, and bring back information oftentimes of the most exact and truthful character. Through your subjective mind, you can read the thoughts of others, read the contents of sealed envelopes and closed safes. Your subjective mind has the ability to apprehend the thoughts of others without the use of the ordinary objective means of communication. It is of the greatest importance that we understand the interaction of your objective and subjective mind in order, in order to learn the true art of prayer. When your conscious and subconscious mind function harmoniously and peacefully, when they work together in unison and in harmony, the result of that is harmony, health, and peace, and joy, and happiness. All the evil, the pain, the suffering, the misery, and the war, and the crime, and the sickness in the world are due to the inharmonious relationship of your conscious and subconscious mind. Remember we said your subconscious is impersonal and non-selective. In the Bible, it says the husband is head of the wife. The husband in the Bible is your conscious mind, and the wife is called the subconscious in the Bible. That's not true uh, from a literal standpoint, but it's true psychologically only. Your subconscious is controlled by your conscious mind. It's amenable to suggestion and controlled by it. So the wife, your subconscious, is sub subject to the man or to the mind and all conscious mind in all things. That's true psychologically only. Whatever your conscious mind, remember, feels to be true, your subconscious accepts. Your capacity to imagine and feel, and your freedom to choose the idea you will entertain, gives you power over all creation. Do not dwell on the imperfections and shortcomings of others, or their frailties, or their derelictions. Why? Because whatever you think and feel about another, you create in your own mind, body, and circumstances. Ask yourself, would I like to live with what I'm thinking and wishing for the other? If you would, if you would, well, uh, if the answer is in the affirmative, of course you're on the right track. Remember, your thought is creative. 
and what you think about the other, you are creating in your pocketbook too, and in all phases of your life. What you do not wish done unto you, do not feel it is done unto you or another. <clears throat> now, chance or accident is not responsible for the things that happen to you, nor is predestined fate the author of our fortune or misfortune. Your subconscious mind is not concerned with the truth or falsity of what you consciously feel or believe to be true. Select only that which is true, lovely, noble, and godlike and your subconscious will reproduce accordingly. The Bible says, Believe you have it now, and you shall receive it. All things whatsoever shall ask in prayer, believe that you have it now, and you shall receive it. That's a psychological law. Assume the mood that would be yours had you realized your desire. And as you do this, wonders will begin to happen in your life. You know, <clears throat> Edison discovered, or he knew intuitively, that the voice caused undulatory currents in the atmosphere. And he reasoned it out. He said such currents could reproduce the voice. The idea came to him that inasmuch as your voice produced waves, that these waves would reproduce that voice. That's believing you have it now and you shall receive it. So he developed a phonograph. The idea came from his subconscious mind. Your subconscious is your friend. Seeks to heal you, to restore you. If someone is uh, presenting you with a phony deal, there's something within you that warns you. That's your subconscious mind prompting you. Its intimations, urges, promptings, murmurings are always lifeward. It seeks to heal you if you cut yourself, if you burn yourself. It seeks to reduce the edema, gives you new skin and tissue. If your child is very sick and you're completely exhausted and you think about uh, waking up, to give the medicine to your child at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, it'll wake you up, no matter how tired you are, exactly at 2 o'clock to minister to your child. Its tendency is always lifeward. <clears throat> electricity, Edison knew, was produced by friction. Reverse it. Friction, in turn, produces electricity. Edison knew the transformation of forces. He knew that transformation of force, that the force is reversible. Heat produces mechanical motion. Mechanical motion produces heat. Cause and effect, action and reaction. These are cosmic and universal. Pray believing that you already possess what you pray for. Yes, and it will come to pass. This is the law of inverse transformation. For example, if the sale of your home brought a certain amount of joy, satisfaction, elation into your mental atmosphere, then the... Uh, a feeling that would be yours if you realized it would also produce that. In other words, that feeling or that mental state captured in your imagination and feeling must produce the sale of the home. Because if the sale of the home, actual sale of it, brought a certain joy and satisfaction to you, then reverse it. Capture the feeling, the mood that would be yours if you sold it. By imagining the check in your hand, giving thanks for it, depositing it in the bank, doing the things you would do where your home sold, all in your mind or your imagination, and then that attitude of mind will produce it. Awaken within yourself the feeling that would be yours if you now realized your desire, and that feeling will produce it. A young boy, a Malay boy, who wanted to go to a certain college, had difficulty, and was rejected, and I said to him, uh, you understand this law of inverse transformation? How would you feel if they accepted you now? You went in to see this man who rejected you and said, well, we've changed our mind. We've looked over your qualifications and you are accepted. He said, I'd feel happy. I'd call up my dad. I'd feel wonderful. Well, I said, as you go to sleep at night, feel that I'm congratulating on your acceptance and your marvelous success in the college. Imagine you're also talking to your dad and telling him you've been accepted. And you're going in there now in your own mind. And this man is saying, well, you're accepted. It's wonderful. All right, you can capture that feeling that in your imagination, that inner mood. And he did that, and he was accepted. Yes, the feeling of the answered prayer, if assumed and sustained, must objectify the answer to your prayer. So that's the meaning. If he call the things that be not as though they were and the unseen become seen. 
If a physical fact can produce a psychological state, then that psychological state can produce a physical fact. That's the meaning of all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing. Believe that you have it now and you shall receive it. How can you believe you have it now? Well, the reality of it is an idea, isn't it? A mental picture in your mind. So you accept the mental picture, dramatize it, feel the reality of it, rejoice in it, believe in the law of growth, knowing that the seed you put on the ground will grow if you nourish it, sustain it, water it, and fertilize it. The philosophy of 6,000 years has not searched the chambers and the magazines of the soul. Emerson said that. Your mind is the, your consciousness is the sum total of all your subjective and objective impressions and awarenesses. Your mind is a medium of ideas. It's a collection of impressions. Some are good and perhaps some are not so bad. Uh, your mind, therefore, is a medium for all sorts of impressions. And your mind should be open only to ideas which heal, bless, inspire, elevate, and dignify your soul. For ideas are our masters. Ideas generate emotions. The reason there is so much misery in the world is the ideas many men hold are completely false. And these emotions get snarled up in the subconscious, and they must have an outlet. And be given a negative nature, it must be a negative outlet. Uh, what saw the steam coming out of the kettle? He was a Scotsman, mechanic. His mother was making a cup of tea, and he saw the result of the steam forcing the lid up. He began to think, what would happen if I harnessed that steam? Tremendous power there. All he had was an idea. He began to think about it from all angles. The idea came from his subconscious mind to force steam into a cylinder, which contained a piston. The expansion forced the piston back and drove the wheels. That was the beginning of the steam engine, which revolutionized industry all over the world. When a man says it can't be done, it was never done before, it's impossible. Remember, the um, science of aerodynamics state, states that the bumblebee cannot fly because its wingspan is too short and its weight is too great for it to fly. But the bumblebee doesn't know what's in the textbook, so it goes ahead and flies. So when someone says it can't be done, the man who knows the power of his imagination, of the great friend within him, says, what does he say? It says, I'm going to do it. It can be done. And the subconscious, which is his friend, responds to him and brings it to pass in a wonderful, wonderful way. Here's a friend also for a ban. Someone mailed me this clipping. It's an unknown Mexican, it says, from the Copley News Service. And uh, he was praying for wealth. That is, he wanted money to do the things he wanted to do. Obviously, he was poor, according to the article. And in a dream, he sees the Virgin, because he had gone to uh, Guadalupe to pray. And the Virgin said to him in a dream, Purchase this ticket, 37281, in the Mexican lottery. He called his nephew in Texas, and he asked him to track it down. So the nephew tracked it down, and he invested the uncle's money to buy uh, the block of tickets. And the uncle won three million, a grand prize in Mexico. The Internal Revenue, the article said, visited his nephew and said, we want $1,600,000 because you were here in America and you bought this ticket. So he took it to the tax court. And the article says, the judge said, well, this man received an answer to his prayer from the Virgin, and uh, the ticket was purchased in his name, and the Internal Revenue doesn't get anything. So that's the friend that gave this Mexican who believed that the Virgin would answer him, three million dollars. That's the friend that's within you. Its ways are past finding out. The Virgin, of course, is the I am within you, your own subconscious mind. It's capable of infinite conceptions with itself, within itself. That's why Mere means the sea, Virgin means the pure mind, the infinite mind, the I am, the presence of God within you. That's called the Virgin Mary in all Bibles of the world. Mary is a Latin word meaning the sea. So it has nothing at all to do with woman or a virgin or anything of that nature. 
because there is that within you that's capable of an infinite number of conceptions of itself without the aid of any man. It created the whole universe. For example, the tree outside your door is an immaculate conception. So is the whole universe an immaculate conception. It came out of the mind of God. He had no one to aid him, for God is all there is. And therefore only God can make a tree. So that's the virgin that is within you. Now, even though he had blind faith and thought he was praying to a virgin, his subconscious responded. Because your subconscious responds whether the object of your faith be true or false. And that's a very interesting thing to know. So it'll answer blind belief too. Uh, the subconscious mind, in your subconscious mind, there is an intelligence and wisdom which comes to the aid in emergencies when a direct demand is made upon it. And there are many, many such instances where scientists, for example, have received answers to their prayers when they couldn't get an answer any other way. The uh, Nicholas Tesla, a brilliant electrical scientist who brought forth the most amazing innovations, he said when an idea for a new invention came into his mind, he would build it up in his imagination, knowing that his subconscious mind would reconstruct and reveal to his conscious mind all the parts needed for its manufacture in concrete form. Through quietly contemplating every possible improvement, he spent no time in correcting defects and was able to give the technicians the perfect product of his mind. He said, Invariably, my device works as I imagined it should. In 20 years, there has not been a single exception. His uh, subconscious mind gave him the answer to all his inventions. A famous chemist, Frederick von Stradenich, used his subconscious mind to solve his problem as follows. He had been working laboriously for a long time, trying to rearrange the six carbon and six hydrogen atoms of the benzene formula. He was constantly perplexed and unable to solve the matter. Tired and exhausted, he turned the request over completely to his subconscious mind. Shortly afterwards, he was about to board a London bus. His subconscious presented his conscious mind with a sudden flash of a snake, biting its own tail and turning around like a pinwheel. This answer from his subconscious mind gave him the long-sought answer of the circular rearrangement of the atoms that is known as the benzene ring, and every high school boy knows how that came to pass. Through this, uh, you might say, flash of illumination from the depths of the man's subconscious mind. Countless inventions came through that way. The Bible says, I, the Lord, meaning your subconscious mind, will make myself known unto a man in a vision, will speak to man in a dream. When I use the term subconscious mind, I'm talking about the great universal mind. I'm not looking at it from a Freudian narrow standpoint, where it deals with a uh, mind of, of uh, sex repressions and frustrations and inhibitions and things of that nature. Not at all. I am talking of the father within which doeth the works. You can call it the supernormal mind the superconscious mind, the subliminal mind. You can call it Allah, Brahma, reality, infinite intelligence, self-originating spirit, life principle. Call it by any name you want to. Actually, it's nameless anyhow. But it is that subjective depths of you, that subjective wisdom and intelligence that controls all your vital organs when you're sound asleep, that sometimes answers your prayer in a dream, in a vision of the night. There are numerous references to, in the Bible to dreams, visions, revelations, and warnings given to men during sleep. Your subconscious mind is active 24 hours a day. It's your greatest friend. The Bible points out that Joseph was accurate in his analyses of the dreams of Pharaoh, his mental acumen and sagacity in predicting the future. Through the interpretation of dreams brought him praise, honor, and recognition by the king. Dreams have captivated scientists, scholars, mystics, and philosophers down through the ages. Many answers to man's most acute problems have been given in dreams. Since biblical days, various interpreters and expositors in every country have been engaged in the analyses and interpretation of dreams. Freud, Jung, Adler, and many other distinguished psychologists and psychiatrists have studied the symbols portrayed in dreams. And by interpreting the meaning to the conscious mind of the patient 
they have released hidden phobias, fixations, and other mental complexes. Your dreams, of course, are projections of the contents of your subconscious mind. Many instances they answer your problems and warn you regarding investments, journeys, and marriage, as well as pitfalls of daily living. Your dream is a dramatization of your subconscious mind, is not fatalistic. You mold, fashion, and shape your own destiny by your thought and feeling. Anything in your subconscious mind is subject to change, and when you know the laws of mind, you predict your own future. You can fill your subconscious mind with the truths of God, and you will crowd out of your mind everything unlike of. For the lower is subject to the higher. Your subconscious is subject to the conscious mind. That's the husband, you see, has charge over the wife in biblical language. But theologians have taken that literally for thousands of years and have held women in bondage and thralled them and in subjection due to a misinterpretation of the Scripture. Uh, once I had a telephone call from a woman in New York City stating that her husband had told her prior to his uh, transition that he planned to take a large sum of money from his private safe and invested in the foreign country for greater returns. A few days later, he passed on, and when the safe deposit in the bank was opened, there was no cash. But there was a record at the bank that two days previously he had visited the vault. There was no trace or record of any investment, and a minute inspection of, the de of his desk revealed no clues. I suggested to her that she turn her request over to her subconscious mind, which knew the answer, for it knows only the answer and that it would reveal the answer to her in its own way. She prayed as follows. My subconscious mind knows where my husband secreted that money, and I accept the answer and believe implicitly the solution will come clearly into my conscious mind. She quietly dwelled on the meaning of these words, knowing they would be impressed in her subconscious mind, thereby activating its response. She had a very vivid dream in which she saw a small black box hidden behind a picture of Lincoln and the wall in her husband's work den. She was shown in the dream how to press a secret button which could not be seen with the naked eye. When she awakened, she rushed to the den, took down the picture of Lincoln. When she pressed the button, revealed in the dream, an opening appeared containing the black box which in turn contained $50,000 in currency. She discovered the treasures of her subconscious. She discovered there was a friend within her, which knows all, sees all, has the know-how of accomplishment, because it is all wise. You too can take a similar step in putting the wisdom of your subconscious to pass, to answer your prayer. A young woman in San Francisco experienced a recurrent dream for four consecutive nights, in her dream, her fiancé, who was living in Los Angeles, appeared to her, and quite suddenly, a very high mountain, which seemed impossible to scale, came between them. In the dream, she was deeply surprised, frustrated, and bewildered. She awoke, wrestling with the problem, and sensing something very wrong and shady. I asked her what the mountain signified to her, as every dream, when interpreted properly, must coincide with the inner awareness and feeling of the dreamer. Moreover, a recurrent dream is very important, as it is the intuitive voice of your subconscious saying to you, stop, look, and listen. The word mountain to her meant an insuperable obstacle. I suggest to her that she speak to her fiancé about the dream and gain the assurance that there was nothing hidden that was not revealed and nothing covered up that was not made known to her. Accordingly, she flew down to Los Angeles to see her fiancé, who met her at the airport. After a heart-to-heart -heart talk, he finally told her, I am a homosexual. I wanted to marry you so that my customers, who are very religious, would not suspect anything. Her dream prevented her from experiencing what eventually would have been a great traumatic shock. You, too, can exercise the same or greater foresight through analyzing the recurrent happenings in your dream. Of course, there are variegated dreams, we know that. Some due to sexual frustration or oppression. Others are due to mental and emotional turmoil, bodily malfunctioning, fears and religious taboos. 
reproduction and a recast of past events or of the activities of the day. However, there are many dreams of a recurring nature, as well as of a precognitive significance, wherein you see events before they happen. Many times you're given detailed instructions in the dream as to what action to take. Uh, <clears throat> there is a wonderful power within you, a subconscious intelligence and wisdom, you know, that uh, man can use. He may be religious, he may be agnostic, he may be an atheist. And yet he can experience this infinite intelligence and wisdom functioning for him. Because you need no creed. If you will call upon it, it will answer you just as well as the atheist or the agnostic gets an answer. It's impersonal, no respecter of persons. You can call it a superhuman intelligence if you want to, or as I said, a subliminal mind or a subjective mind, or the I am, they call it Om in India. But the point is, the presence of the infinite is within you. It's in your own subliminal depths. It's all through a law. It is there, and we should use it. It works as you sleep. The German proverb is, night brings counsel. You know, your body doesn't rest. Your heart and all the vital organs are working while you're sound asleep. Your conscious mind is in abeyance. You turn away from the vexations and the strife and the contentions of the day. But two-thirds of your life is controlled by the one-third in sleep. What do you go to sleep with every night? Go to sleep in the feeling that you're a tremendous success, that you're absolutely outstanding. If you have a problem, contemplate the solution. Say, infinite intelligence gives me the solution. I accept the answer. It comes to me in divine order. So that subjective self of you corrects the errors of the day and anchors your thought uh, to the supreme intelligence within you. In other words, the ancient Hebrew said you participate in the wisdom and the foreknowledge of the gods when you're sound asleep. Because healing currents are released when you're asleep. The Bible says, He giveth his beloved in sleep. I lay me down in peace to sleep, for thou, Lord, maketh me dwell in safety. Arthur Rohr, a great industrialist, a business tycoon, when he has a conference, and there's a, a very uh, important decision to be made. He closes his eyes, relaxes, let go, let, let, let's go, let's go, rather. And his associates do the same thing. They get quiet and still. What do you suppose they think about? That there is an infinite intelligence within them that knows the answer, knows what's best for the organization, knows the right decision, for there's nothing it doesn't know. And therefore they contemplate that right decision, the harmonious solution, the creative idea, in the quietness of their own mind, in that quietude, in that relaxed state, the wisdom of the subconscious rises to the conscious mind when the conscious mind is in abeyance. And he gets marvelous results. Then when they open their eyes, they know the decision to make. And it's always right. Because when your motivation is right, your decision will be right. If your motivation is wrong, no matter what you do, will be wrong. And therefore, when you're asked to make a decision, well, ask yourself, what is my motivation? Looks good to me. And that proposition he made looks sound. I prayed about it. Infinite intelligence guides me, directs me what to do, and reveals to me the answer. Then it looks good to you, and your motivation is right, and whatever you do will be right, because it will be right action for you. Robert Coleman, who used to be an usher here, is living now in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's familiar with a number of uh, medicine men down there, Indian medicine men. He told me an interesting thing about a member of the tribe who was very ill, and the local medicine men couldn't do anything for him. Couldn't do anything for her, rather, because it was a woman. And they brought in this special um, medicine man, and he said when the, the special medicine man came in, they had a pot of boiling hot water. The test of a medicine man is that he can put his hand, his arm, into this boiling water and there'll be no inflammation, no burn of any kind, and leave it there for about ten minutes. That's a sure sign. He is disciplined and trained, has served his apprenticeship. And then after that, he said, he put some blankets on the woman 
chanted some Indian songs, that is, prayers, incantations, holy songs, of holy songs based upon their tribal beliefs. And then he said he lay down beside the woman, went to sleep, calling on the great spirit. When he woke up, he said the friend has healed her. And, of course, meant the great spirit. Uh, that's what the uh, this particular tribe calls God, the great spirit. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he came, of course, believing. And uh, in this passive, quiet state of mind, as he began to chant, the woman, of course, was receptive, open-minded, ready to receive. According to your faith, is it done unto you? According to your belief, is it done unto you? And she being open and receptive, and he full of faith and confidence in the vitality, the intelligence, and the miraculous healing power that is within him. And his faith is communicated to her in that deeper state of mind. And then she got well. That's what we call a prayer therapy, or some people call it spiritual treatment, and so forth. It's simply dwelling upon the infinite spirit and power that is within you. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord thy God. I will come and heal thee. I will restore health unto thee and heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. All these, of course, are biblical, uh, biblical expressions. All healing is of the most high. But there's only one healing presence, you say. And uh, when you pray for a person, just like this medicine man did, you don't dwell on symptoms of the bodily condition or fever or anything. You just dwell upon the intelligence, the wisdom, the vitality, the wholeness, and the beauty and the perfection of the infinite, animating, sustaining, and strengthening this other person. And then the presence of God is resurrected in the other. And that's the basis of all healing. Dr. Elsie <clears throat> McCoy in Beverly Hills, who wrote an article for my book called Psychic Perception. And I'm quoting what she said. Uh, she was engaged to a very wonderful surgeon in uh, Chicago. She gave me permission to write this in the book, of course. And she shows clearly what constructive thinking according to principle will accomplish. She has studied extensively in Europe and Asia. Her early days was engaged to a prominent surgeon in Chicago. They were separated by over a thousand miles due to their different assignments. She operates in Beverly Hills. Ever since she was 18 years of age, she has made it a habit, she said, to affirm during the day, only divine right action takes place in my life. And whatever I need to know is revealed to me instantly by the infinite intelligence within me. Her gradual reiteration of these truths caused them to reach the subconscious mind, which responded accordingly. One night, while she was sound asleep, she saw and heard clearly, in a vivid dream, her fiancé in Chicago talking to a nurse, and in addition, dating her for a weekend, saying to her, You know I am engaged, but she is a thousand miles away and knows nothing about it. Dr. McCoy phoned him the next day and told him about the silly and foolish dream she had had and laughed about it. He was furious and accused her of having employed detectives and of spying upon him. With that, she dissolved the engagement and subsequent events showed the wisdom of her subconscious in protecting her from what would undoubtedly have been a tragic marriage. Her right thinking activated her subconscious mind, which revealed to her what she should know before she got married. And that's a very interesting thing. So the subjective seeks to protect you if you'll only listen to it. Some brush these things aside and say, oh, it's only a dream. Um, <clears throat> but um, there's such a thing, you know, as precognition, as prescience, seeing events before they happen. And also you can protect yourself if you see something negative for yourself or another because prayer will change your mind. Uh, a, girl, a girl we'll call Louise is written up in psychic perception, by the way. Her name was Louise Barrows before she got married. 
She is now Mrs. Wright, a secretary of mine, and she was informed many years ago by her foot surgeon that it was necessary to operate on her left foot to bring about a healing, and that this would necessitate having her leg in a cast as well as using crutches for two months or more. She prayed that infinite intelligence of her subconscious mind would guide and direct her to come to the right decision. She turned this request over to her subconscious mind every night, and at the end of the fortnight she saw a doctor, a friend of the family, who in the dream state pointed to hexagram 35 in the I Ching, which said, Progress. The next day she went to visit him, and on examining the foot, he advised her that he could bring about a perfect alignment and adjustment by manipulation and exercise, which she would have to practice, and a perfect healing followed. That's back in 1961, the first time I gave a series of lectures on the meaning of the I Ching for Southern California. Uh, actually, I think I was the first to introduce it here. The subconscious mind usually speaks and reveals answers symbolically. Louise, having taken two classes on the I Ching with the speaker, became absorbed and engrossed with its scientific and metaphysical approach to life, and undoubtedly her subconscious knew she would follow the directions of the hexagram, for it always speaks to you in a way, in a voice, in a symbol that you will follow and understand. It will not speak to you in a voice of someone you dislike or you disapprove of. It spoke literally to her, when it revealed the doctor she should see for the healing of her foot. <clears throat> so the Lord makes himself, the Lord is the lordly power within you, there's only one power in the owl, makes himself known in a vision and will speak to man in a dream. <clears throat> That's what your Bible says because it also says, in a dream and a vision of the night when deep sleep falleth upon man, slumberings upon the bed, he openeth the ears of man, Feel it their instruction. There's only one being, and that power is within you. It's called the life principle, called the living spirit almighty, it's called by many names. But remember, you do not put self-expansion into the seed. You do not give vitality to the seed. You put the seed in the ground, it won't grow in your pocket. And you water and fertilize the seed. And as Judge Stroud, the author of the inimitable textbook, says, your quiet contemplation of your desires, an accomplished fact, is the way to pray. The feeling of pleasure and restfulness in foreseeing the certain accomplishment of our desires is the way to get the answer to your prayer. The operation, he says, is that of a gardener. And it's more or less an exact analog of that of the gardener. We do not put self-expansion or vitality in the seed. We sow it, don't we? And then we uh, water it and fertilizing it, knowing that it's going to uh, expand and unfold in a wonderful, wonderful way. And, of course, it will expand in a wonderful way if you water it with faith, with expectancy, with understanding. And then wonders will begin to happen in your life. <clears throat> a thought is the most powerful force in the universe, you know. Your word is a thought expressed. If you are in a position of authority, your thought or word can direct how missiles, nuclear energy, dynamite, or thermonuclear weapons are to be used. Your thought determines how electricity is to be used. Likewise, your thought directs the operation of your life. Your subconscious mind could be likened to an iceberg. Ninety percent of it is below the surface. It is your subconscious mind that does the work according to the orders given by your conscious mind. What you think with your conscious mind, you produce with your subconscious, you see. Uh, a very interesting thing, which uh, I think you will appreciate, is um, to know about Dr. Arthur Thomas. He's now Minister of the Church of Religious Science. Uh, in uh, Pasadena, but he was the minister in Reno, Nevada, for a long time. He gave me permission to write uh, this about him. He had been a captain in the British Navy at one time, 
more recently had been in the wholesale business as well, in the, as, well as in the real estate in Los Angeles. About ten years ago or more, he started attending my lectures on Sunday mornings. He said, I realized suddenly my thought was the only creative power of which I was aware, and I was going to create what I really wanted. Consequently, he began to affirm to himself frequently, I am a minister now. I am teaching the truth of life to people. This is what he used to say to himself. Every night he would imagine he was expatiating on the great truths to a wonderful group of men and women in a church. Not any particular church, just a church. You can do that in your mind, can't you? He continued to think along these lines for a month or so when he decided to take the ministerial course at the Institute of Religious Science here in Los Angeles. Confident of the end result, as he had already imagined and felt as true the reality of that which he imaged in his mind. He passed all tests and examinations in divine order, was offered the church immediately after finishing his seminary course. He is now doing exactly what he decreed mentally. He knew that his subconscious mind would respond mathematically and accurately according to his thinking process. That's the meaning of according to your faith, is it done unto you? And of course it is. During a trip to uh, Mexico a few years ago on his famous pyramids, I met a minister who had a pronounced facial tick, which was very aggravating and humiliating to him. He had received alcoholic injections which were supposed to deaden or paralyze the nerve. But after some months, the tick flared up again. The condition became very acute when he spoke before his congregation or other social gatherings. He had reached the point where he was actually contemplating resigning because of the comments of the people and his own sense of embarrass embarrassment. You know, the tick was in the right eye, and you think... Well, the, uh, uh, this particular aggravating condition would go on while he was talking. Well, as he said to me, was, you know, a lot of people think I'm dating someone or I'm flirting with them, he said. After a prolonged discussion, I remarked that I had a deep, that I had a deep inner feeling that he had a pronounced sense of hurt plus a guilt complex, which he was unwilling to face subjectively and objectively. This tick condition was affecting his right eye, which could possibly symbolize something he did not want to look at in his home or office. There was some reason why his subconscious mind was selecting his face and his right eye as a scapegoat. This situation needed his psychic perception to recognize how to deal with it. He admitted freely that he no longer believed in what he was teaching, which gave him a guilt complex. Moreover, he was afraid to resign because he felt he could not make a living outside the ministry. He deeply resented members of his board who criticized whenever he deviated from the orthodox standard of teaching. All this nervous pressure was converted by his subconscious mind into a tick. The affliction compensated him in a morbid way for his failure to be honest and forthright and admit to his congregation that he no longer believed according to the directives and dogma of the church. He freely admitted this to me, and I suggested to him, in turn, that on the following Sunday when he returned from his vacation, he should speak freely from the platform and tell his congregation that he was resigning, since he no longer believed what he was preaching. He understood that to teach one thing and to believe another created a powerful negative conflict in the mind, resulting in mental and physical disorder. He spoke from the depths of his heart to his congregation, then resigned. In a letter to me, he said, I felt a tremendous relief and a great sense of peace came over me. My constant yeah, affirmation Honolulu, was... A few years ago, where I wrote uh, a book, 
I had a most in interesting conversation with an old friend whom I had known previously in India. I shall call him Harry. He uh, practiced clairvoyance, astral excursions for many years. His daughter was studying in Honolulu, had been very ill, actually at the point of death. A cable was sent to him in Calcutta, and the moment he received it, he adopted a yoga posture, closing, closing his eyes, got into a passive, quiet, receptive state of mind. He visualized his fourth dimensional or astral body emerging through his head with all his faculties, and he decreed firmly, knowingly, and with deep conviction, I want to appear instantly to my daughter and minister to her. I might interject here that, of course, astral traveling, fourth dimensional traveling, uh, has gone on since the dawn of time. In other words, man can live outside his body. Modern science knows that today. The average man is living in the dark ages. He doesn't even know what's going on. You can see, hear, feel, smell, travel independent of your physical organism, as we said at the beginning of this lecture. And you can see without eyes, you know, hear without ears. You can do all these things. Nature leaves no gaps and makes no mistakes. So it was intended that you use all these faculties transcendentally of your environment. So he said, I want to appear instantly to my daughter and minister to her. He repeated this command about six times, then dropped off into a profound slumber. Notice the wonders of your subconscious mind. Immediately he found himself at his daughter's bedside. She was asleep, but awakened immediately and exclaimed to him, Dad, why didn't you tell me you were coming? Help me. He placed his hands upon her and chanted certain religious phrases and told her, You will arise in a few hours and be well. She had a wonderful healing. Her fever immediately subsided, and she shouted to the nurse, I am healed. I am well. My father was here, and he healed me. The nurse thought she was raving, but the resident physician confirmed the silent inner knowing of her soul that she was indeed perfectly well. However, both laughed at her story of a visitation by her father from India. The nurse was puzzled and perplexed, and said to the daughter, How could your father or anybody else get in from downstairs through closed doors? I saw no one enter your room. The daughter explained to the nurse, Oh, my father visited me in his fourth-dimensional body. He laid his hands on me and prayed with me. The nurse said, I don't believe in ghosts, apparitions, or voodoo. The girl realized that further explanations would be useless. Um, Harry said that he was perfectly conscious all the time. Considering the distance between Calcutta and Honolulu, and the time difference, he discovered that he'd been absent from his physical body just ten minutes in all. Harry is a medical doctor, has tremendous faith in spiritual healing, is very familiar with the many schools of healing. He realized his presence gave a tremendous transfusion of faith, confidence, and courage to his daughter, which impregnated her subconscious mind, and according to his belief and that of his daughter, it was done unto her. These are the wonders of the friend within you. That's the deeper mind. Your subconscious mind is never short of ideas. There are within it an infinite number of ideas ready to flow into your conscious mind and appear as cash in your pocketbook in countless ways. This process will continue to go on in your mind, regardless of whether the stock market goes up or down, whether the pound sterling or dollar drops in value. Your wealth is never dependent on bonds, stocks, or money in the bank. These are really only symbols, necessary and useful, but only symbols. So as you go to sleep at night and you say to yourself, wealth, success, wealth, success. Well, you admit there is such a thing as wealth. You admit there is such a thing as success. The infinite can fail. The infinite is within you. You're born to win. You're born to succeed. Just take these two words. What happens? They activate the latent powers of your subconscious, and you're compelled to succeed. You're compelled to be wealthy. The point I wish to emphasize is that, if, is that if you convince your subconscious mind 
that wealth is forever circulating in your life, and there's always a surplus. You will always and inevitably have wealth, regardless of the form it takes. It has taken the form, as you know, the amalgam of copper and tin or zinc or something right now. It hasn't any intrinsic value. You use a piece of paper, don't you? The only value it has is the value that we place upon it. The government says uh, this $10 bill will buy so many oranges and all that. All it is is a piece of paper. It isn't even silver. It's not even gold. Uh, there are people who claim that they're always trying to make ends meet. They seem to have a great struggle to meet their obligations. Have you listened to their conversation? In many instances, their conversation runs along this vein. They're constantly condemning those who have succeeded in life and who have raised their heads above the crowd. Perhaps they are saying, Oh, that fellow has a racket. He's rootless. He's a crook. This is why they lack. They're condemning the thing they desire and want. The reason they speak critically of their more prosperous associates is because they're envious and covetous of the other's prosperity. The quickest way to cause wealth to take wings and fly away is to be envious, jealous, or criticize and condemn others who have more wealth than you. You can rest assured that that will impoverish you and bring more and more lack into your experience. There is one emotion which is the cause of the lack of wealth in the lives of many people. Most people learn this the hard way. It is envy. If you see a competitor depositing large sums of money in the bank, and you have only a meager amount to deposit, does it make you envious? The way to overcome this emotion is to say to yourself, isn't it wonderful? I rejoice in that man's prosperity. I wish for him greater and greater wealth. And you're selfish when you do that, because what you're wishing for him, you're creating in your own mind, body, and experience. To entertain envious or jealous thoughts is devastating because it places you in a very negative, destructive position. Wealth flows from you instead of to you. If you are ever annoyed or irritated by the prosperity of the great wealth or success of another, claim immediately that you truly wish for him greater wealth and success in every possible way. This will neutralize the negative thoughts in your mind and cause a never greater measure of wealth to flow to you by the law of your subconscious mind. If you are worried and critical about someone whom you claim is making money dishonestly, cease worrying about him. You know such a person is using the law of mind negatively. The law of mind takes care of him. Your Bible tells you, fret not about evildoers and the workers of iniquity in your 37th Psalm. So read the 37th Psalm. It's a great eye-opener, you know. Be careful not to criticize a man for the reasons that we just said. Remember, the block or obstacle to wealth is in your own mind. You can now destroy that mental block. This you may do by getting on mental good terms with everybody wishing for everyone what you wish for yourself. And as you do, wonders will begin to happen in your life. It is your right to be rich, you know. You're here to lead the abundant life. You're here to be happy, radiant, and free. You should therefore have all the wealth you need to lead a full, happy, and prosperous life. Of course you should. You're here to grow, expand, and unfold spiritually, mentally, materially, and professionally. You have the inalienable right to fully develop and express yourself along all lines. You should surround yourself with beauty and luxury. Why be satisfied with just enough to go around when you can enjoy the riches of your subconscious mind? Yes, make friends with money, and you will always have a surplus. Your desire to be rich is a desire for a fuller, happier, more wonderful life. It is a cosmic urge. It is not only good, but very good. Money is a symbol. It means to you not only freedom from want, but beauty, luxury, abundance, and refinement. It's a symbol of the economic health of the nation. When your blood is circulating freely in your body, you're healthy. 
When money is circulating freely in your life, you're economically healthy. Engage your friend. Your friend is your subconscious. will give you all the wealth you need to do what you want to do when you want to do it. When people begin to hoard money or put it away in tin boxes and become charged with fear, there's economic illness. Money has taken many forms as a medium of exchange through the centuries, salt, beads, trinkets of various kinds. In the early times, a man's wealth was determined by the number of sheep and oxen he had. Now we use currency and other negotiable instruments, as it is much more convenient to write a check than carry some sheep and cattle around with us to pay our bills. Now, as you go to sleep at night, and every night you go to sleep, practice a very simple technique. Repeat the word, wealth, words rather, wealth, success. Wealth, success. You admit there's such a thing as wealth. Walk down the street, go out into the country, can you count the stars or the sands on the seashore. And you're born to win, to succeed. The infinite can fail. The infinite is within you. So wealth, success, use these words, quietly, easily, and feelingly. Do it over and over again as a lullaby. Yes, you will be amazed at the result. Wealth will flow to you in avalanches of abundance. This is an example of the magic power of your subconscious.